Right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's SMR webinar on flotation chemistry. And I'd just like to thank Rick Valenta for the screenshot behind me. I thought it was incredibly appropriate for today's seminar because our speaker is, is Dr. Lisa Forbes, a senior research fellow at JKMRC. And Lisa is an expert in flotation chemistry and is one of our facilitators of our upcoming flotation chemistry course, which will be run online for the first time starting on the 21st of May. So if you're interested, please register. Um, Lisa specializes in mineral flotation and her main interest lies in integrating fundamental and applied aspects of flotation research with the primary aim to develop new and improved processing technologies. As per the previous webinars, please use the Q&A session or option at the bottom of the screen to put your questions in as Lisa goes through the talk. And then at the end, I will pass on your questions to Lisa for her to answer, um, and, and then we'll bring the session to an end. So for now, I'd like to hand over to Lisa. Lisa, we really look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Neville, and uh, welcome, everybody, all um, 70 of you. That's quite a good turnout. So uh, today's webinar is titled Dr. Strangeforth or How to Learn to Stop Worrying and Love Flotation Chemistry. And so today what we're really talking about is the concept of learning about flotation chemistry and understanding how it fits in within um, your work and what you have to do in order to make your process run. So um, a little word of warning, uh, I have been stuck in quarantine with young children. So this would probably explain the flavor of the webinar that you're about to see. So there you go. So first we'll start with a bit of an introduction on the topic and we're going to talk just a little bit about what is flotation. I'm pretty sure that most of you know what it is, but it's still important just to go over the basics a little bit. Flotation is a physical chemical process that involves both physics and chemistry to separate valuable minerals from gang. It is one of the primary stages of all mineral beneficiation and it's hugely complex and we don't fully understand how it works. We have a great idea, but we're not 100% there yet. And so for those who aren't aware, this is just a very basic schematic of how flotation works. You have a flotation cell that is agitated. You add air, which ends up in a cell in the form of air bubbles. Where is my pointer? In the form of air bubbles. My pointer is not working. Um, and you have both the desired particles and the undesired particles. And so the idea is for the desired particles to attach to the bubbles while the gang particles remain behind, the desired particles float up into the flotation froth and become recovered as concentrate. And this process has three main phases. What is happening? There we go, three main phases. And that is the probability of collision, probability of attachment and probability of detachment. In very simple terms, particles and bubbles have to collide. Once they collide, they have to stick. And once they stick, they have to stay stuck. And that is what we need in order for flotation to work. And the probability of bubble particle attachment is the one that is most important from the chemistry perspective. So why is that? It's because bubble particle attachment is a chiefly chemistry driven phenomenon. And that chemistry can be adjusted to either encourage the formation of that bond between a particle and a bubble and to regulate how strong that bond is or to discourage that bond from forming altogether if you're dealing with an unwanted gang mineral particle. And all of this can be achieved through a carefully calibrated suite of reagents that you add into your flotation system. And so typically flotation reagents form into three major categories. There are collectors, if you want to make something float or if you want to make something stick to your bubble. If you want to stop something from floating, you use a depressant. And frothers are used to condition your bubbles to make them suitable for flotation, but also to control the froth phase that recovers out of your cell. There are plenty of other reagents that are used. Those are usually called promoters, activators, surface modifiers, flocculants, and depressants, and a few others, but those are the main ones. And so when it comes to any um, flotation process, how do we typically select and adjust that suite of reagents? Well, the first and foremost mechanism by which it happens is legacy. You have 
a way that things have always been done on a particular plant and those ways typically do not change. So one continues with a, um, a traditional approach towards selecting reagents. Uh, the second approach is to use what is used in similar operations. So if you're starting up a new plant, the best way to look at to suggest what you're going to use as you look at what your neighbors are doing who have a very similar system, for example, a, a popper hole. And so you use a similar reagent suite to what has been used in similar systems. The third is my personal favorite is site lore, is that you have on every site, you will have a piece of information that only this specific reagent will work on this, either this bank or cell or this ore. People don't quite know where this information came from and how it works, but their conviction in its veracity is very, very strong. And finally, you have recommendations from reagent suppliers. When you want to choose a reagent, you call up your reagent supplier and they make a recommendation and that is what you go with. But what you don't very often see is a systematic process of reagent selection that is based on an in-depth understanding of both the reagent system, your ore system, and how that reagent system is going to work with your ore. That does happen, but not very often. So why is that? Well, foundation chemistry is hard. Uh, everything is nonlinear. Uh, we have multiple things interacting with multiple things and going around and reinteracting with multiple things. This is generally seen as a very specialized area with an over-reliance on so-called experts. Also, in order to truly understand what's happening in your system, you have to hold extensive plant trials. And plant trials are expensive. They're very difficult to design and difficult to run. They pose a very high risk to your production schedule and the results that you get are often inconsistent and inconclusive. And so, the main thing, uh, as well as all the ones above, is there's also a general understanding of the subject matter, and it's generally seen as a bit of a dark art, um, where you know we put in the ingredients and something magic happens on the other end. So how do we get to this point? How do we learn about flotation chemistry to begin with? Well, it all starts in undergraduate programs. When you get to undergraduate programs in general, mineral processing subjects, not just flotation chemistry, but all of them, are really not well covered in undergraduate programs. Um, mineral processing typically is incorporated into the wider chemical engineering curriculum. This isn't a case across the board, but it is something that is happening increasingly across universities in the world, where mineral processing student numbers continue to shrink, and in order to support teaching these systems, they just kind of get shoehorned into the more generic chemical engineering curricula. So mineral processing courses uh, are relegated to elective status and are not seen as core disciplines. Um, and when they are taught, they tend to be providing a very broad overview of the subject matter without really going into specifics about how any of the particulars of the discipline work. In particular, when it comes to flotation chemistry, uh, flotation chemistry is either taught by someone who knows their way around mineral processing, but isn't necessarily a flotation chemistry expert. And so the material that gets covered tends to be quite superficial. Alternatively, um, the subject matter is handed over to someone who is either a chemist or a surface scientist, in which case, they go very deeply into the subject matter, but without having the appropriate exposure to industrial flotation practice. And so what you lose out on is the context. And so what that ends up looking like is something like this. When we learn about reagents, it tends to be very oversimplified. So most of you who have done these, um, uh, this subject at university undergraduates programs would have seen diagrams that look like this. This is how I was taught about reagents or how when doing undergraduates. We are taught that yes, there are different types, collectors, depressants, and frothers. We all know about those. We also get shown these very reductionist diagrams that frankly look like something belongs in high school sex ed class as opposed to um, university curriculum, but we get told that reagents have components, they have heads and they have tails. Um, and we get often very simple, often very reductive explanations for what they are. Well, collectors are hydrophobic, depressants are hydrophilic, 
That's, that's what it is. But we don't actually get any further explanation than that. And so what does that mean? What makes a collector hydrophobic? What makes a depressant hydrophilic? So why are some reagents so weak and some reagents are strong? Why are some of them selective and others are not? Why do collectors have frothing properties? Why do frothers have collecting properties? You know, why are molecules? Uh, and the problem is, most of the time, we never get to find out. And then you get to the other end of the extreme, and then you get to the study of interfacial phenomena, which is very often completely overcomplicated. If it is taught at all, it tends to be taught in a way that completely gets buried in the detail. You tend to get bombarded with these very complex diagrams and lots of equations and fundamentals and how much concepts uh, constants and surface forces. And the way that it gets taught is very inconsistent. You either get given a very broad overview within a very short time period, which leaves people mostly confused, or people go into very, very high level of depth, um, going along and explaining things on a level that doesn't necessarily help you on a practical level. And it doesn't do so within the appropriate context of flotation practice. What I've never really seen explained in undergraduate is how understanding surface phenomena actually helps you run your plot. And I have personally spoken with people who saw diagrams that look like this, who at that very point decided that surface chemistry was just not relevant and ridiculous and have given up on it and threw in the top. And then what happens when people graduate from undergraduate programs, they get to site. And what happens on site is that the vast majority of metallurgists learn on the job. Uh, they either acquire knowledge that is passed down from senior staff, and some senior staff are much better and more equipped at teaching younger um, metallurgists than others, or they typically learn it from handbooks, where our good old favorite is Barry Wills' Mineral Processing Technology, which has served a fantastic function for generations of metallurgists. In fact, I was speaking to one of the um, one of our clients, a person from one of the sites, who was complaining about how little training they get on site, where you show up after graduation and they throw a book at you and expect to learn how everything works. At that point, his friend turned around and said, "Well, at least you got a book." Um, so the most often used book is Barry Walters Mineral Processing Technology. And in there, you would have, most of you would have seen diagrams that look like this that classify certain types of reagents into very specific categories. And in both books, handbooks, and in plant knowledge being passed down from one metallurgist to another, the general approach is that to think of it as a recipe. If you want to bake a cake, you need these ingredients. So if you want to achieve something, you do X, Y, Z. And so that particular knowledge tends to be very limited to a specific operation where you have um, plant staff that are very familiar with the plant, they're very familiar with their process. And they have a heuristic knowledge of what works from a reagent perspective. And the knowledge is always uh, focused on the what. What do you do, what you add to get to a certain outcome? What you almost never see is why it happens and how it happens. So the underlying mechanisms uh, just don't really come into it. And then what invariably happens, one day your ore changes and your recipe stops working. And so what's the result? The result is that these are some very, very high level complex concepts that are not well taught at all, if taught at all in undergraduate curricula. Your literature that covers a lot of these subjects is not aimed at metallurgists or graduates. It is aimed at specialist chemists or specialist flotation chemistry specialists. Uh, and it is often completely incomprehensible to a non-specialist reader. And then the relevance of all of these disciplines to flotation practice is often not made clear at all. And as a result, most people simply end up ignoring these concepts altogether and saying that they do not apply to them. And what ends up happening is that most metallurgists 
understanding of free agent chemistry looks something like this. What you have is a list of ingredients. You have sugar, spice, all things nice, plus a healthy dose of chemical X. And if you have anything to do with flotation, you will know that X always stands for xanthate. You mix them all together, what do you get? You get the Popoff girls, okay? Uh, and by the way, one of the Popoff girls is named Bubbles. So this metaphor is at least 30% appropriate to this topic. So if the way flotation chemistry is taught is not the best, how should we be doing it? Well, that's an excellent, excellent question. First step towards good teaching of flotation chemistry is to understand that there is no recipe. There is no magic ingredient that will only absorb onto one mineral and not another. There is no secret book of knowledge that you can go and look up what is the appropriate chemistry to use with an appropriate mineral under any circumstances. And also chemical selectivity, a complete and total chemical selectivity is a bit of a myth because everything interacts with everything. In fact, there are no absolutes when it comes to flotation chemistry. But if you understand how things work and why things work, you can find ways to make it work in your system that isn't rigidly fixed on a recipe approach that allows you to be a lot more agile and adaptable when things in your plant start to change, as they always do. So, how do we get to grips? with understanding the hows and the whys. Well, it is my personal opinion that there are four major components that you need in order to fully understand flotation chemistry. One, you have to understand how surface forces work. Surface forces are not just something that you have to cram to pass an exam. They are actually a very useful tool that you can use to control your system. Two, you have to understand what reagents are made of and how they work. Again, a lot of people see diagrams like this and say, well, it's just a whole bunch of sticks and molecules. It's meaningless. It's not, which is a useful tool. Third, you have to start to understand what is happening on the surfaces of minerals. Your minerals, your ore, if you don't understand how your ore functions, you will not get to grips with how to control it using chemistry. And finally, perhaps the most important step is you have to put it all together within a practical flotation context. So why do we need to know about surface forces? Well, flotation is all about surfaces. You have surfaces of bubbles within the gas liquid interface. You have surfaces of particles within the solid liquid interface. And finally, you have a three phase interface gas, liquid, and solid when you mix all three together. When you insert any surface in water, it will behave differently than if it is placed in air. And the surfaces begin to be impacted by a series of forces. Those forces can be attractive and those forces can be repulsive and you never have any one single force present in your system, but always a balance of multiple, often opposing forces acting between your particles and particles or particles and bubbles or bubbles and bubbles. And this, the underlying premise of particle bubble attachment is that a particle and a bubble will be held together by a net attractive force. In other words, the balance of forces has to skew towards the attractive as opposed to that of the repulsive. And since flotation it depends on particles attaching to bubbles and those particles are held together by forces. It is very important to understand that it is the forces that you manipulate with your reagent suite. Your collectors, depressants, surface modifiers, solution modifiers. An underlying principle of how they work is that they manipulate the balance of interparticle forces. So the understanding of surface forces is not just this arbitrary concept that you have to learn about. It is hugely useful when you are trying to control your system. And even if you don't have control over some of these forces, because you don't always, it can help you understand the limitations of your system. 
So a very good motto that I really like is keep calm and use that force. Next up, we have compositions of reagents. A lot of people sort of say, right, well, it's chemistry. I don't know enough about chemistry and I don't need to know about chemistry and it's all too complex. Well, no, it's actually relatively simple if you break it down into the necessary components. And in that way, flotation reagents are actually very much like Lego. What you have is collective process depressants are simply made up of different types of building blocks. And if you can go beyond the basic reduction of head and tail and start to look into some of the subsections, some of the types of blocks that make up the type of molecules that make up the tails and the kind that make up the heads, you can start to understand how the reagents are built. And just like Lego blocks, you actually have a very small number of the types of blocks that you use. And if you put them together in different ways, they can make literally infinite types of permutations. So what are the basic reagent building blocks? Well, when we are talking about reagents, we are used to hearing about heads and tails, but instead of talking about heads, it is very useful to think of them as an absorbing group. In other words, a chemical component that directly interacts with a surface. And over here above, we've got the type of chemical groups that can form absorbing groups for all reagents. You would notice that up here in the top right corner, we have xanthate. Xanthate is an absorbing group. And we always think of xanthates, well, what's a xanthate? It's a collector, not quite. It is simply an absorbing group of a collector, as xanthate itself is not a collector make. In fact, they, you can have a depressant molecule that has a xanthate absorbing group. So what they are is that these groups interact with a surface, either via chemical interaction or opposite charge interactions, or there are several others out there. And what these groups do is they determine selectivity and they determine how strongly your reagent is stuck onto that surface and what kind of surface they would preferentially stick to. The tails of the molecules can also be thought of as water facing groups and these groups are the ones that determine the type of reagent that you're going to have so for example if you have a hydrophilic water facing group the one that is a long polymer that is highly water soluble it would make your reagent overall hydrophilic and is a depressant so what it does is that you have an adsorbing group such as this that sticks to the surface and attached to it you have a coating or a water facing group that would determine how that surface is altered as a result of that reagent being present. You can think of them as tiles and glue. So your absorbing groups are the glue that is holding the tile to your floor and the water facing group is the kind of laminate you're going to have on the surface of your floor, be it wooden tile or ceramic or whatever you want it to have. So on the other hand, you can also have a water insoluble hydrocarbon group as your tail and because it is water insoluble or hydrophobic that would make that molecule a collector and the kind of molecule its properties its molecular weight its degree of substitution its branching will determine the strength of that reagent and how effective it is it's doing its job so I'm not trying to confuse anybody here by showing a whole lot of diagrams of chemical, um, of chemical structures, but the idea is that there really aren't that many types of building blocks that exist. And it is very easy to go through the majority of the types out there and get familiar with what they look like and then start to realize how reagents are put together. And once you've done that, it makes your life a lot easier in terms of recognizing what they are. So understanding reagents is a useful tool. It takes away all the mystery of having chemical X. Once you know what chemical X is, you can have a much better idea of how to utilize it. It allows you to have informed choices when you're making reagent selections for your process. It allows you to interrogate your system. What happens when your recipe no longer works? When something goes wrong, you'll be able to see why to some extent. 
It also reduces a very blind reliance on the providers of free agents who always understand your system far less than you understand your system. As metallurgists, one has to have a lot more faith in one's ability and one's familiarity with your own operation. And so to have somebody from the outside come in and tell you what you should be doing is it doesn't make all that much sense. What makes a lot more sense is to be able to interact with those people to get them to help you as opposed to having them give you that information wholesale. And so a note on talking to reagent suppliers is that, well, you're very often speaking to either a sales agent or a fellow metallurgist and not a chemist. So reagent suppliers often don't necessarily have any more chemical knowledge or skill than your average metallurgist. And so to rely on them to provide expert inf information isn't always useful. So also companies do not like to reveal the composition of their products. Very often they are covered by commercial sensitivity where um, they can't tell you what's in their system, but sometimes they can't because they do not know what's in their system. There is often a um, kind of interaction we have. You phone up a reagent supplier and you ask them a specific question about the chemical makeup of their reagents, and they simply cannot, they cannot answer the questions because they don't know. So they'll have to send you up the chain to somebody up in the head office who will be able to answer those questions. But if you don't ask the question in the first place, you won't be able to get there. Also, products that you get as batches of reagents are mixtures of several reagents. And it's very hard to know which bit does what. Now, the pro tip is that you always have to look up your material safety data sheet that mandates that um, you know exactly what is in the batch that you're receiving. And if company sends you an MSDS, it simply says it contains stuff or substances, well, then I think you should be dealing with a different reagent provider. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make is that if you are informed and you understand that line to line basics, you can find much better common language between yourself and your operation and the people who are supplying you with their reagents and are making recommendations for reagent suites. It will allow you to ask the right questions and possibly even get to the point where you can ask the right questions of the right person because the person on the front line of selling their agents may not be the expert that you need, but you won't know until you ask the right questions. Okay, so number three, mineral surfaces. As I keep repeating over and over, flotation is about surfaces. Different minerals have different chemical compositions, which means that on the surface, their chemical surface properties will also be different. And the surface chemistry will determine how floatable that mineral is. Does it float naturally? Does it not float naturally? How does it interact with other minerals? But also it will determine how it interacts with the reagents that you're putting into your system. And to understand your surface properties of your minerals, well, you have to understand your ore. You have to know what minerals are present in your ore in the first place. You have to identify the key minerals. You have to ask yourself, are they valuable? Is there more than one valuable species? Do they need to be recovered separately or in one bulk concentrate at one stage or a different stage? Are they deleterious? Can you throw them out onto the tailing stem or do you have to sequester them somewhere safe? Uh, are they going to cause processing problems like talc or are they simply toxic like arsenic? And um, is your gang naturally floatable like pyrite or is it nice and benign like um, quartz? So all of these are very important questions that lead onto different disciplines such as mineralogy, which is tightly um, woven in with the understanding of flotation chemistry. So understanding your ore is a useful tool. You have to understand the key components of your ore in order to make an adequate decision on how you select your reagent suite. Minerals and their compositions, it doesn't have to be mysterious. There are plenty of uh, literature sources where you can simply look them up. And if you don't like looking onto a scientific article about a specific mineral, well, there's actually quite a few um, really reputable sites out on the internet, like mindat.org, where you can simply type in a uh, type of mineral and it will tell you its full chemical composition. The whole thing is that the nature of mineral surfaces will determine how that surface can be manipulated. Whether that surface needs to be made hydrophobic, 
with the use of a collector or what kind of collector? Well, does it need to be made hydrophilic with a depressant or the kind of depressant? Does that surface a sulfide or is it an oxide or is it a carbonate or something else? All of those things will feed into the kind of forces that arise as a result of your surfaces and how those forces can be manipulated using an appropriate reagent suite. And finally, finally, you have to put it all together. And any kind of information that you teach to somebody within a course always, always has to be cemented by demonstrating how it is useful to your everyday experience. And the best way to do that is to look at series of case studies. Now, those case studies can come from laboratory trials or they can come from pilot trials or full-scale trials. All of those are really good examples of how reagents can work within the system. Problem is, whenever sites do such trials, the information is often, often confidential and you can't simply lift it out of the work that you've been doing with them and present it as part of the course, which is why it's always helpful to have lots of friends in industry that would allow you to use their case studies as part of teaching material. Um, and then, of course, when you put it all together, you don't just present the outcome of a trial. You don't just show a great recovery curve. No, you have to gather up all the information to present it together and interpret the results. What were the minerals? What was on their surfaces? What reagents were used? What was the composition of those reagents? And what is the effect of all of those things that have on the interfacial forces between your particles and your bubbles and the particles and your particles? And always make sure that you ask, what did you expect to happen knowing what the chemistry of this reagent was, what the surface properties of this mineral was, and how they were all interacting together? Did what you expect to happen actually happen? If it didn't, what made the difference? And um, if it did make a difference, how do we fix it? How do we make it work in a way that we expect as opposed to something happening that we can't explain? So to summarize, uh, flotation chemistry is hard and it's generally fairly badly taught, if in fact taught at all. But it doesn't have to be this way, it really doesn't. But this chemistry can be taught in a way that discards this reductive recipe approach and really covers the underlying basics that explain how it works and why it works. And the most important of all is that it has to be put into context with real world flotation practice. So how do we do it right? Well, as I've said, you have to cover the four underlying principles, how surface forces work, what reagents are made of and how they operate and how they influence their surface forces. What happens on mineral surfaces and how do they interact with these reagents? And finally, how do you put it all together that makes sense within flotation practice? The second point is, well, you have to respect your audience. Metallurgists, they really do know their business and they often know it way better than either researchers like myself or reagent suppliers. And so you always have to be prepared to learn as much from the people you are teaching as they are willing to learn from you. It's an interactive process. It's definitely not about imparting knowledge, it's about exchanging knowledge in a way that benefits everybody. Um, and always, 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 you have to present your material in a way that is contextually relevant to the particular audience that you are talking to. So if you're talking to base metal processing or precious metal processing, um, operations, you have to tailor your material to suit their needs. Um, thirdly is, well, you have to select the right people to put the course content together. Uh, it is very hard to find any one person that, that has all the relevant skills to be able to effectively impart all this information. So, but it doesn't have to be one person. You can have a team of people putting the expertise together to help do this. Um, and always try and include either a chemist or a surface scientist to tackle some more of the gnarly concepts. And this is very important, don't chalk and talk. These are very deep, complex concepts where you have to really engage with your audience and never let them switch off. Keep asking questions, keep trying to get them to comment. Don't just talk at them, interact with them. 
be prepared to answer any and all questions at all times because there's nothing that signals your own lack of competence is being asked a question that you can't answer and then have to dodge and duck around it. And always, always bring the material back to the context that is specifically relevant to your audience. But always keep an eye on a bigger picture. Um, it's very easy to get tunnel vision when you get very deeply engaged with a subject such as surface, such as flotation chemistry. It is only one aspect of a complex flotation system. There are plenty of others. There's all liberations, particle size, cell design, cell hydrodynamics, circuit design configuration, and most importantly, is the site operational practice and skill level of your metallurgy team. And uh, if you have a team that does not have the necessary tools to help them run their plant, simply chucking the right chemistry into your system isn't going to help. And because absolutely no webinar is ever complete without shameless self-promotion, in order to help you develop your metallurgical team, SMI offers a suite of professional development courses. The one on flotation chemistry, I'm giving that on the 21st of May of this month, of this year. Uh, however, there are plenty of others. Uh, process mineralogy, geometallurgy, cultural heritage and mining, the list is quite long. And I would encourage all of you to um, not just focus on flotation chemistry, but all other ways to professionally develop your teams. And SMI is here to help you do that. Thank you very much. All right, Lisa, I was just waiting for the, uh, the video to finish playing before I interrupted. Oh, it doesn't. It's on the loop. <laughs> we've, got, uh, we've got a couple of um, a couple of questions, but I just wanted to start by saying thank you very much for, for your presentation. Um, and um, as you know, this is an area that interests me greatly. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you very much for your presentation. So we've got two questions at the moment. So if you have got other questions, please, please put them in the Q&A. Um, sometimes people pop them into the chat box. I think if you can just transfer it across into the Q&A, that would help me, because uh, trying to get across the two systems is a bit tricky. Um, so the first question is, is, um, is the process of surface attachment um, of absorbing groups, is it absorption or is it chemisorption? Thank you, Neville. That's a very good question. And it depends, is the usual answer. In some cases, it is chemisorption, and in some cases, it is adsorption. So in the cases of sulfide minerals, so take a classic example of a xanthate. So there you have a um, xanthate sulfur-based um, molecule that actually chemically reacts with the mineral surface. That's chemisorption. In the case of, for example, um, a carboxy, uh, a carboxylic acid group is what you have in most of the presence. That tends to absorb by a mixture of opposite charge attraction, which is absorption, and some degree of chemisorption. So um, as I've said previously, when it comes to flotation chemistry, there is no one single block of this is how it works. It's always a mixture of a whole lot of things. And the final result will depend on the balance uh, of what is the most prevalent mechanism, because there's never just one, there's always a mixture. I hope that answers your question. Please let me know if it doesn't. All right, Th thanks Lisa. Um, the next one is, is there any particular iron index strength number to classify minerals to have an idea of surface chemistry? Uh, sadly, no. It would be nice if there was. Um, the when it comes to minerals, the mineral surface behavior is not inherent to a particular mineral. It also depends on the chemical environment within which that mineral exists. And so what you often hear is that there are effects of different ion types that are present in solution that would have a bigger or a lesser effect on the mineral surface. For example, um, multivalent metal ions will have a much stronger effect on the surface than monovalent ions, such as sodium and potassium. Uh, also, the different minerals, even if you're dealing with the same type of mineral, chocolate pyrite, depending on the deposit and depending on the chemical context which, within which it exists, it would have different surface speciation. So, no, sadly, there is no simple index that you can refer to. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, what do you think is the future of integrating this knowledge into metallurgical simulators? Ah, excellent question. So currently, 
these do not get integrated into meteorological simulations and uh, simply because, well, it's a bit too hard. But I think steps are now starting to get taken where we start to think about how we would go ahead and do that. And the onset of more sophisticated analysis equipment that allows you to actually look on mineral surfaces and try and really tie in the nature of the surface with its flotation behavior will start to take us more upon the path of trying to predict how flotation output is going to be determined by the nature of the chemical system. We're not there yet, and I uh, think it will probably take quite a few years before you are, but steps are starting to get taken before you get there, uh, for us to get there. All right, thank you. And then um, this one starts with great presentation, so well done. <laughs> And what methods or tools do you currently use to study the surface force interactions? Ah, there's so many. Uh, so the, you, you can have a whole suite of sophistication for tools. You can go really sophisticated and then you can go to surface analysis such as um, X-ray, uh, photoelectron spectroscopy, TOF sims, which is um, secondary ion emission spectroscopy. Uh, you can go to Roman spectroscopy, so all the, all the fancy stuff. But then there's also your middle, middle of the road techniques where you can look at contact angle analysis, you can look at induction time measurements, or you can simply look at determining the absorption rates of, of reagents from solution. And then you go one step further, and then you get to micro flotation, batch flotation. If, it is design, if the experiment is designed properly, you can actually intuit quite a lot about what's happening on surfaces. So what you have is a range of techniques going from very fundamental to increasingly more practical. And it is my opinion that you can't rely on either one or the other. You can't just simply sit on one or the other end of the spectrum. You have to apply a range of techniques in order to fully understand about what's happening at both the microscopic or the nanoscopic level and at the more practical bulk level. Well, th thanks, Lisa. The next one is, um, once again, thanks for a good presentation. Um, you refer to literature for mineral composition but would exact mineral chemistry be important for flotation, e.g. the trace element substitutions or the variation of iron and cellarite? Um, so, you know, would an EPMA analysis, would that be important? Yes, it is absolutely very, very important. Um, particularly when it comes to minerals such as pyrite, the microchemistry or the nanochemistry in some cases can have a very disproportionate um, effect on the surface properties or the overall mineral properties of that mineral. So if we're using pyrite as an example, its surface properties are very strongly determined by its um, uh, electrochemistry and its um, electrochemical arrest potential. And the tiniest variations within its internal geochemistry, such as the presence of different trace elements within its matrix, can have a very disproportionate effect on its electrochemical potential and hence the way that it reacts in solution. So yes, it's a very important factor. All right, and then Lisa, the next one is, um, starts very much with a, a comment and having read the comment, I completely agree, um, having had to make these decisions in the past is in addition to the optimization of the separation from a metallurgical perspective, ultimately the optimal economic solution is sought. Um, and this may lead to a reagent choice that may not be optimal metallurgically, but due to cost-benefit analysis still ends up being selected. Um, and I've seen that cost-benefit analysis done, done often, um, sometimes well and sometimes not so well, um, but often this aspect is overlooked. Do you think it is an important aspect that should be included in an undergraduate course or at least be considered? Uh, sure, uh, they, that is hugely important. And the one of them, points that I made in, in this presentation is that there are a great many things that should be included in undergraduate programs that aren't. But yes, the focus on the techno-economics and cost-benefit analysis considerations for choosing uh, plant operations should absolutely be covered at undergraduate level, no question. Um, and that doesn't just go for flotation chemistry, it goes for all sorts of analyses. So understanding the financial operation and financial considerations of, um, of process operations is hugely important. 
All right, and I'm, I'm very glad to see who sent in this next question. Um, fantastic to have um, previous colleagues online. Um, so to what extent does the hydrophilic chain on collectors, for example, xanthate, affect mm -hmm. the collectivity, or is this more? Right. Um, that is a fantastic question. Thank you very much. I don't know, simply because there has not been enough work done in the area that looks at the effect of the hydrophobic chain on selectivity. We traditionally think of the adsorbing groups, such as xanthate, as the driver for selectivity. There are questions that arise whether the branching or the linear nature or the length of the chain, how that affects the spatial distribution of the molecules upon the surface, whether if you have something that's very branchy and bushy, whether that's going to prevent other, um, other molecules from attempting. I don't think so, but I could be wrong. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, um, Lisa, I've seen some published work which um, does show changes with, with chain length and, and the branching. Um, what is always interesting is whether that's done at the same um, molar concentration um, and, and often changes in um, concentration of the reagent, so adding more versus less of the different chain lengths also has an effect. And with flotation, often these impacts aren't separated out to be able to make a definitive. So there's probably as many articles saying that there is no impact as there are articles saying that there is an impact. But I think the most definitive work I saw was from Cape Town University. So there's, there's some information on that, but it, um, there are ways of um, optimizing it. And that's where that economics comes in. So sorry, I... I oh, no, no, please. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, for that, Neville. And, and I think you're completely right. And the reason why I don't want to commit to an answer is, as you say, that there is no definitive answer out in the literature. So. Yeah, I think it, it fits in that it depends... Uh, yeah. Right. Could you provide a practical explanation of ORP measurement in flotation and how this helps the operator to tune flotation performance? Okay. Very good question. Uh, so ORP me uh, measurements, for those who aren't quite familiar, usually refer to the measurements of um, EH, electrochemical potential, as well as dissolved oxygen. Um, the uh, pH, EH, dissolved oxygen. Uh, those are very, very useful because in particular for sulfide minerals, your floatability of, um, or the natural hydrophobicity of a surface would strongly depend on its chemical potential, which can be manipulated by the, the presence of oxidizing or reducing reagents in your pulp. And those can be either measured or controlled with the use of ORP measurements. So, um, you will often have a very non-linear reaction. So for example, in a very reducing system with negative EH values, the floatability of your uh, mineral will be very low, close to zero. And then as soon as that mineral starts to oxidize with an increasing um, oxidizing environment, your flotation rate will go up, it will reach a peak, and then will start to drop. And so knowing where that optimal flotation window is, is very important. And that's why you have to take those measurements to figure it out. Um, the, the floatability is determined by both the natural floatability and the presence of things like um, elemental sulfur species in the surface is one mechanism how it's affected. Another is that collector molecules will be a lot more um, uh, likely to react with uh, a sulfoxy species or a metal ion present species present in the surface than hydroxide species present in the surface. So yes, hugely important, not done enough. Everybody start making ARP measurements on your site. All right, and um, Lisa, this one, I think um, you probably um, have to get an email because it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a quick answer, but I'll, I'll read it out anyway. In the context of commissioning of a given mine site, would you recommend a suite of particular tests so that the metallurgical team can understand better the interactions of the reagent chemistry with their metallurgical results? And if so, which type of tests would you recommend? Okay, uh, I'll be very happy to engage with that one offline in a greater detail, but to start off with, with a similar question I went earlier about what are the kind of techniques that you have, you have a range 
health techniques, going from more analytical that help you determine how things work to the more higher scale and practical that would tell you exactly what happens when you try a certain thing. So I would say whenever you're trialing out, uh, setting out your test program, always make sure that you are doing a range of techniques going from the more fundamental to the more practical. What that range actually looks like will be highly dependent on your plant, but also will be strongly dependent on the financial considerations in terms of how many resources you have to throw at the problem. But uh, I'm very happy to engage with you on that um, offline. All right, fantastic. All right, and then here's another one that's dear to my heart. Um, for the flotation of fine particles, here they're saying less than 20 microns. I'm interested in less than five microns. Uh, for super gene all, it's complicated, yes. Uh, what will your comments be on that? Um, and are there more improvements um, in terms of equipment? Right. Uh, another excellent question. The, the level, I'm very impressed with the level of questions that are being asked. So thank you guys for that. That's actually, it's a pleasure to answer these questions. So the... When dealing with um, very fine particles, obviously the huge problem with those is the hydrodynamics and the way that those particles move within the solution that in a way have nothing to do with chemistry. However, the introduction of very fine particles introduces the fact that you have so many more surfaces to contend with. And the degree of liberation of your particles also changes very dramatically when you're dealing with a lot of fines. And that will also change the way that you introduce reagents into your system and the way that those reagents will ultimately spread over this much higher availability of surface that you have. So there are questions raised whether if you have a system that contains both very coarse and very fine particles, where would the reagents preferentially absorb onto, the very fines or the more coarse? And some of the work that's been done before indicates that reagents would preferentially absorb onto the finer particles because that's where most of the surface is. And so if you want to regulate that and if you want to work with that, there are some pretty novel and inventive ways in which you can introduce your reagents, such as on the surfaces of bubbles as opposed to in solution. Um, so yes, there's lots of interesting, exciting things happening in that area, but I would say when it comes to very fine particle, the thing that you have to worry about the most is the hydrodynamics. Right, thank you very much. It, um, it does remind me of a question I asked Professor John Ralston many years ago, what size particle no longer attaches to bubbles? Um, and uh, very interested to hear what people's views on that is at some stage. Right, um, here's really a comment, and it's that the underlying mechanism of hydrophobicity is still unknown, um, despite four decades of research. Um, I think that question gets deep and meaningful. No, the whole can I, I love that question. It's a beautiful question. Thank you for that question. Um, I am of the firm belief that the hydrophobic force does not exist. You know, fight me. <laughs> Um, I am very much with my Japanese colleagues who believe that hydrophobic force arises from the presence of nanobubbles on mineral surfaces. That is essentially a way of air that precipitates within an oxygen-rich system. You have air that precipitates onto mineral surfaces that are naturally hydrophobic. And the result is that you have capillary forces acting between bubbles and particles. Uh, this is a contentious issue. Work is ongoing, but I've picked my side and you can fight me for it. <laughs> All right, um, these are the next one is really around different types of collectors. So glycol-based collectors um, used to be more persistent in water than in comparison with alcohol-based collectors. Um, the reason for the question is important in terms of the reclamation, water coming back into the flotation circuit um, from the tailing facilities. And I know you've done some work on this recently. Yeah, um, the, again, it, com it comes back to um, how flotation frothers and collectors can actually have very similar structures. So a lot of frothers are glycol molecules and alcohol-based molecules and sometimes mixtures of both. And uh, collectors tend to have fewer alcohol and glycol type properties because in order for a collector to be effective, the hydrocarbon chain has to have very high water insoluble properties where both glycol and alcohols have those um, oxygen groups dispersed within them that makes them more water soluble and hence less hydrophobic. Um, but yes, the concept of trying to 
play around with these blocks, these Lego blocks that I've talked about for different collectors in order to not just serve a purpose of being an effective collector, but also to be reclaimed afterwards in water and to be recycled or biodegraded is a very important one. By their nature, collectors stick to mineral surfaces and so they do not easily go into solution um, to be reclaimed after later. So the, that still is an area that needs a lot more work. Right. And I think it picks up on the next question, Lisa, but also a previous um, seminar that we had, I think it was seminar number one, there was a question mark about biodegradable flocculants. And um, I think we passed on to you um, where there was a, a concern around flocculants that will end up in tailing facilities um, I don't know if you want to just comment on that for those. Um, yep, sure. I can quickly so. comment on that. Uh, so all um, flocculants are long chain polymeric molecules. Uh, so they are all sort of long chain, um, kind of like polysaccharides. A lot of flocculants tend to be either polyvinyl or um, polyacrylic molecules, which are synthetic molecules uh, derived from uh, petrochemical byproducts. And so for that reason, they are degradable, but not biodegradable. So when they do degrade chemically, they tend to leave behind these shorter degradation products that can be toxic, not always, but they can be. There are, however, plenty of flocculants out there that are derived from natural materials. So it can be either just plant cell walls, which will give you cellulose. So for example, um, guar gum, or oh, that type of reagent is directly derived from a guar bean, which is so benign, it's often a food additive, we can eat it. Uh, a second type of material is lignin, which is derived from wood or wood derivatives, which is also biodegradable. And the third is chitazan, which is derived from uh, shellfish or the carapaces of um, shellfish. Uh, and so you can have an option of going for those reagents, which could possibly be a bit more expensive and harder to uh, fine tune with their properties as opposed to the vinyl and the acrylic type. All right, thanks, Lisa. So the next one really just picks up on the, the water chemistry and how important is that to flotation? Water chemistry is hugely important to flotation. It's just it is immensely important and it cannot be ignored uh, at, at any cost. So we've talked about the importance of ORP measurements. So you're talking about pH, pH, salinity. Um, all of those have a huge impact on the interactions between the reagents and the surface. So water chemistry can have an effect on the reagents themselves. They are instances where you can have a depressant, that's a reagent that you add in order to um, make your surfaces hydrophilic and under a certain chemical condition those molecules can collapse and suddenly become hydrophobic so your depressant can switch to being a collector as a function of water chemistry so yes incredibly important all right we um we have got one minute left so we've got two questions um and um these will go through these quickly so the one is the effect of dissolved gases in macroscopic and microscopic level on the surface interaction and flotation? Nanobubbles. Nanobubbles. Yep. <laughs> uh, nanobubbles are, I, th I think, a fundamental reason why something has a, what looks like a hydrophobic attraction. So, yes, yeah, hugely important. Pretty much can't do without it. All right. Uh, I know we've uh, run out of time now, so I'll just, the last one is can we use the same reagents when we treat slimes, even though it has enough? amount of valuable mineral, or should we change the ratio of composition? Um, so I'm, I think there's particle size effects, different reagents, different compositions. Um, uh, yes, I think the slimes are never quite the same as uh, large particles, even if it's the same ore that's been ground down to that same size, because the composition and elaboration of individual particles is going to change. Um, so you would need to have a modification of some sort. So un unless your, your system mineralogy is such that your individual surface composition of particles isn't going to change as a function of size, which it always will, uh, you will have to make modifications to uh, the type of reagents or the quantity of the reagents that you're using. All right, Lisa, then just up to me to thank you very, very much for your presentation and your time.
And I think we, we probably could have done with another half an hour of question and answer session, which really highlights how many questions there are in this space. Um, and my takeaway is it largely depends on the system um, and understanding the system and how it works. Um, but in the back of my mind, I do remember the, the great debates I've had with Martin Harris and, and Chris Smith around how important the physics as well as the chemistry. So Lisa, thank you very, very much for that. And we really appreciate your time. So just, just to wrap up, um, just a reminder of the flotation chemistry course, online course. And if, um, if you're interested in getting into more detail, please register on the SMR website. And then next week's webinar, um, we will have the CEO of the new CRC Time, um, uh, Dr. Guy Boggs, as well as Professor Anna Littleboy, um, giving an outline on the fundamental aspects of this 10-year CRC that has been sponsored by the, by the CRC. So thank you very much to everybody for joining me. I look forward to seeing you all again next week, Tuesday for our lunchtime seminars. And Lisa, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. Thank you.